Scott Manley here, and today I am flying something which was designed about 70 years ago. Now, if you've been following the news today, you probably know that 70 years ago, in October 14th, 1947, a guy called Chuck Yeager was the first man to fly an aircraft faster than the speed of sound. At least, the first one that is verified without dispute. Uh, however, this is not that aircraft, although it does bear something of an uncanny resemblance to it. No, this is supposed to be a clone of the Miles M52, which was a secret British project around the same time. So there's a lot of similarities you might notice, right? The, the fuselage is kind of bullet shaped, the wings are kind of short and stubby, it has a full moving tailplane, which uh, turns out to be something that uh, the X-52 didn't originally have. Okay, there, there's a little bit of controversy here because after World War II, Britain and the US were doing a lot of research sharing. After all, you know, they'd uh, kind of helped each other, you know, develop nuclear weapons, defeat the Nazis, all the kind of things that best friends do for each other. So they thought, uh, so it was decided that the two teams working on the X-1 and the Miles M-52 should share research data. And so the Miles team delivered all their design drawings to the US team, who then decided, no, in fact, we don't actually want to share any of our data with you. Okay, I mean, <laughs> I'm going to be absolutely clear that people working on both sides of the Atlantic were amazing engineers and would absolutely have come up with the correct solution all on their own. But yeah, most notably, the tailplane on the X-52, or sorry, the X-1, didn't contain, didn't have a full moving tailplane, which was one of the kind of innovations that was really required to get control at supersonic speeds. There's multiple problems that can occur, but generally what happens is over the top of the wing and the bottom of the wing, the supersonic shock wave can form in different locations and that creates differential pressure at the rear of the wing causing it to pivot. You can also get the case where a shock wave forms in the middle of a control surface and the pressure on that basically makes it impossible for the pilot to deflect the surface using the control stick. And uh, the, the aircraft could end up going into a steep dive which would be very difficult to recover from and not everyone did. So by having a, an all moving tailplane it meant that many of the issues with uh, shockwaves generating partway across the wing were eliminated. It, and it, you know, most supersonic aircraft now have a full moving tailplane. Called, it's called a stabilator. It's, it's like a combination of an elevator and a stabilizer. So the M52 also was notably different from the X1 in that it used a jet engine and in theory would have been able to take off from a runway and get up above Mach 1 using only its jet engine. It was also one of the first aircraft to be designed with the idea of having an afterburner on it, which, you know, was quite innovative for the time. It certainly wasn't the first one to fly with an afterburner because, of course, they did tests with other aircraft. But this was the first one designed from the ground up to have an afterburner that would deliver the top speed required. So I measured this thing out using a realism overhaul. This is a realistic landscape here, realistic scale, earth, realistic uh, you know, ferrum over space. Everything is I've tried to make as realistic as possible. The dimensions I measured from all the available drawings, all the mass is the same. The only thing that's different is this jet engine, which is actually... Um, completely the wrong jet engine, but it's sort of close in a number of ways. It doesn't actually get us up to the speed required. I also suspect that we have a lot of drag in here. Now, this is an interesting part here because you have this uh, annular intake here and the crew is, sits in front of this. Because the cockpit would have been so narrow, the pilot would actually be practically laying on their back flying this thing. Originally, the test pilot was going to be, of course, Eric Brown, the greatest test pilot in the history of the world, flown more, more aircraft than any other person, and probably more aircraft than any other person will, because they don't make quite as many aircraft these days. But um, yeah, it had undercarriage, it could fly, but there was one really interesting innovation that this thing would have, or one feature that this thing had over the X-1, which I think is kind of cool. Say they did encounter some problem, say the control deflection got too high and the thing got into some sort of crazy, uncontrollable 
spin just like this and say the amazing test pilot skills of Eric Brown were found wanting and he was unable to escape. Well, they had one special option. They could actually detach the cockpit, leave the aircraft behind, and then of course it had a parachute which would bring him safely back to the Earth. See, uh, there were many things the M52 had that the X1 didn't, but ultimately the project was cancelled before it had a chance to prove itself. It was decided that supersonic research was to be performed with unmanned aircraft instead, and they built rocket planes, launched them from the top of a de Havilland Mosquito to see how fast they went. Sometimes they failed, mostly because the rocket engine failed. The airframe proved to be surprisingly reliable on these uh, scale model drones, and they were all based on the M52 design. So yeah, a little bit of history that many of you may never have heard of. This is the Miles M52, what could have been, but of course what was, was that Chuck Yeager was the first person to fly beyond the speed of sound and live to tell the tale and have the data to prove it. And uh, you know, that's a great anniversary, right? Of course, speeds have only got faster since then. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.